and welcome everybody uh, welcome back as we restart the program of the pathology grand rounds lectures after the summer break uh, as usual if you have questions for this morning's speaker please can you put your questions in the Q&A box there's a button for that at the bottom of your zoom screen it gives me great pleasure this morning to introduce our speaker for today who is Professor Helen Coleman uh, Professor Coleman leads the Cancer Epidemiology Research Group at the Centre for Public Health at Queen's University Belfast. She's also the Deputy Director of the Northern Ireland Cancer Registry. Previously, Helen spent time conducting research at Vanderbilt University, Nashville, USA, at Ulster University and at the MRC Human Nutrition Research Centre in Cambridge. And she was a visiting scientist at the Fitzgerald Lab at the University of Cambridge. Helen's research mostly focuses on the epidemiology and early detection of gastrointestinal cancers and conditions, including pre-malignant conditions. She has a particular interest in Barrett's esophagus and esophageal adenocarcinoma, and also in colorectal polyps and bowel cancer. She collaborates widely, including with pathology leads for the Northern Ireland Barrett's esophagus register and the Northern Ireland bowel cancer screening pathology data analysis program uh, and I'm delighted to introduce her and I thank her very much for agreeing to speak to us this morning uh, and her lecture is entitled insights from molecular pathology epidemiology studies of gastrointestinal neoplasia thank you very much over to you Helen all right. Thank you very much, Mark. It's an absolute honour for me to be here this morning and to talk to this Pathology uh, Society audience. So I'm very grateful for the opportunity to share some of our work uh, from Belfast. I'm very aware that I am coming from an epidemiology background and not a pathology background, but as uh, Mark mentioned in the background, a lot of our research is highly interdisciplinary and relies very heavily on collaborations with pathologists. So thank you for the warm welcome and for joining early on this Wednesday morning. So uh, for those of you who have not been to Queen's University Belfast, uh, or at least in recent years, uh, you may be familiar or may have seen pictures of the main Lanyon building at Queen's University Belfast, which is in the top right hand side. It really is a beautiful campus, uh, but in the Centre for Public Health, we're uh, based in one of the satellite sites out at the Royal Victoria Hospital site in West Belfast, which is the bottom picture. And one of the fortunate things for our research and for collaborations is that our Centre for Public Health is located directly opposite the Institute of Pathology. And this is really important. This geographical closeness is, is really helpful for some of our collaborations in our research. And I wanted to preempt this talk with thanks to my pathology collaborators throughout my career, but in particular to my closest collaborators in Belfast, Dr. Morris Lockray, with whom I co-supervised many uh, research students, uh, Dr. Damien McManus, who has been fundamental to our Barrett's esophagus research, um, Professor Jackie James and Professor Manuel Salto Tellez, who have set up a really fantastic infrastructure in Belfast that has facilitated much of the research that I'm about to talk to you uh, about today. So I always like to start with this slide because as an epidemiologist, it's very important to me that our research and our studies are designed in a way that is as representative as possible of the population. And Northern Ireland just happens to be very well placed to conduct population based research. Much of the work that we do can represent the entire population. We're quite a small population. The, the most recent census showed that there's only 1.9 million people in Northern Ireland. This is about one or two suburbs of London. Um, but what that means is that we can do complete data coverage using electronic data registration in a very efficient way. 
The fact that we are geographically constrained from the rest of the UK means that patients who are diagnosed with conditions here are highly unlikely to travel to England or Scotland or Wales for their treatment. The vast majority will stay in Northern Ireland for their treatment. And in addition to that, as a population, particularly in our older age groups, there is very limited migration. So net migration is less than 1%. In addition, thanks to the NHS, we have a largely free healthcare system at the point of delivery. And again, that means that patients diagnosed with conditions in Northern Ireland are highly unlikely to travel to the Republic of Ireland for treatment where there is a mixture of private and public healthcare. So we can say with, with good confidence that individuals who are diagnosed with conditions and particularly with cancer are highly likely to be treated and followed up within Northern Ireland as a population. And that's quite important for some of the research that I'm going to describe um, in my talk this morning. So my starting question for much of my research is actually very basic. And it's amazing what you can do just by counting, just by counting the number of cases. So as an example, the starting point for me is often how many patients have a certain condition, for example, Barrett's esophagus in Northern Ireland. And as a starting point, then we look to the pathology labs and the pathology reporting systems to help us with this. So if we're creating a registry of patients, as we have done for Barrett's esophagus patients, what we start off with is a download of all esophageal biopsies um, from the pathology labs in Northern Ireland, of which there are now four. And there are data sharing agreements then that allow that information to be transferred into the Northern Ireland Cancer Registry, which is one of the highest quality cancer registries in the world. For a condition like Barrett's esophagus, certainly going back to the 90s, whenever we started this registry, uh, the debates around the definitions of the UK versus US definitions, and whether it's columnar lined epithelium or whether you need intestinal metaplasia to be present, meant that we didn't want to rely just on SNOMED coding. And uh, we actually still undertake a manual review where somebody reads all of these pathology reports and we have a set of standardized guidelines. Um, that manual review also is done in duplicate as a 10% quality check. Within the registry then we have systems that we can auto populate a lot of information on the patients within our databases. So we get information on age, sex, and we can derive from patients postcodes an area based measure of their socioeconomic status, which isn't ideal, but it's still helpful for us to determine if there's any differences in deprivation. We also then from the pathology reports extract information uh, from the clinical summary at the top about Barrett's length and um, whether dysplasia, intestinal metaplasia was recorded by the pathologists and if samples had to uh, be uh, double, were read in double header meetings or, or uh, were reviewed by more than one pathologist. Within this registry then we, we importantly start off with Barrett's esophagus, um, excluding any prevalent cancers and excluding junctional biopsies is obviously very important. And thanks to the health and social care number that we have, we can do uh, data linkage in an anonymized way um, to the cancer registry and to death records. And that allows us to do passive follow-up of patients in a highly complete way. So we never have to contact patients. Um, there is ethical approval and consent, um, uh, ethical approval in place. That means that we don't have to get individual consent um, for these population-based registers. So as an example, and I've highlighted my postdoctoral research fellow, Dr. Victoria Karendoff here. Um, we started off with a registry of just over 12 and a half thousand patients who had been diagnosed between 1993 and 2010. And we've conducted a recent update which involved reviewing almost 52,000 pathology reports 
And we have now almost doubled the size of the registry with just under 25,000 patients. So this is one of the largest and certainly most complete population based registers um, in the world. And through that linkage then to the cancer registry, we can identify follow up information. So that basis of the pathology reports allows us to conduct a lot of important epidemiological research. And one of the most um, impactful publications was more than a decade ago now, published in JNCI, where we were actually the first population-based study to publish that the risk of progression to cancer in Barrett's esophagus was much lower than previously reported. Uh, 0.3 percent per year whereas up to that point it was thought to be greater than one percent of patients would progress each year. Of course um, some of you may be familiar that the Danish registry published their data six months later in the New England Journal of Medicine so there's a lesson for us all there to, to aim higher <laughs> with, with our research um, but this was a really fundamental and important study. Again just from a uh, an account of patients and from those data linkages to the cancer registry. But where the registers really come into their own is through uh, the ability to use them as a sampling frame for biomarker research. So this is an example of a study where we collaborated with Professor Rebecca Fitzgerald and Professor Lawrence Lovett's teams to uh, identify a potential risk stratification biomarker panel for Barrett's esophagus. And um, we initially looked at eight different biomarkers, but found that there were three, one of which was having two expert pathologists um, review and identify low-grade dysplasia, um, DNA ploidy, and abnormal expression of an immunohistochemical marker, uh, AOL. But it still wasn't great. It still wasn't enough to put things into uh, uh, clinical guidelines. So that straight line in the middle of panel B would be if you rolled a dice, you know, if you took a 50-50 chance of this patient um, progressing to cancer, that's what you would find. When you add on information such as age and sex, that C statistic improved to 0.63. And when you added on these three biomarkers, it improved again to 0.75. So you were able to identify an additional 12% of progressors. So good, but unfortunately not good enough to be used in clinical practice just yet. But this type of research is really important and we hope that we'll be able to inform um, future panels with similar designs. Other research that we do then is very much based on descriptive epidemiology. So we can quantify the proportion of esophageal cancer and high grade dysplasia um, cases that were likely to have been present at the first Barrett's diagnosis, but unfortunately missed. And that was estimated to be about one in 10 cases. We've also published work on case series in uh, columnar metaplasia in children, which is of course incredibly rare. Um, but this case series of 41 children, again, is one of the largest reports in the world. We also try to use a, a variety of very pragmatic factors, uh, like clinical factors, such as age and sex and lifestyle factors, alongside um, genetic factors and others to try and identify people in the general population who are at risk of uh, esophageal cancer and who may then be suitable for screening. As you might expect, as an epidemiologist, we do a lot of research on modifiable risk factors for cancer. So as an example here, we've published from the UK Biobank, which is a cohort of half a million individuals um, on the risk of esophagogastric cancer with um, physical activity. <clears throat> But bringing that more into your world, then um, we very much uh, want to better understand the mechanisms behind some of these things that we are observing with our descriptive epidemiology. 
So a great example in GI cancers is the male predominance that we see and that we still don't fully understand. And some work led by my colleague Una McMenamin tried to investigate if sex hormones might explain some of these differences. And it found that there were some associations with gastric and colorectal cancer, but for esophageal adenocarcinoma, there was no differences at baseline in people's levels of estradiol or other sex hormones that were um, examined. We've then in collaboration with colleagues such as Damien McManus and Jackie James tried to uh, see if that translates through to outcomes for patients. So uh, if sex hormone receptor expression in uh, esophageal cancer tissue is associated with survival. Um, and we didn't find anything there. So the, the, the jury is still out, but the ability to study these questions using different exposures is very important. This last example then I think is probably the most important to set up the rest of my talk. So we have uh, published some work that uh, shows that aspirin is not associated with survival uh, in patients with esophageal or gastric cancer. And of course, <clears throat> equivalent studies in colorectal cancer have shown some very promising results, particularly in subgroups of patients with PIK3CA mutations. Um, but my feeling is that we might be missing something by looking at these patients as a whole. And if we try to better understand some of the mechanisms that we know were involved in the pathways of aspirin metabolism, such as the pathology study that we did here, looking at COX-2 or PTGS-2 expression. We did see some associations with uh, better survival in esophageal adenocarcinoma patients in those who had higher expression of this biomarker. So what I'm talking to you about today then is trying to bring together these two worlds where we look at epidemiological risk factors and lifestyle factors in conjunction with some biomarkers that would be typically assessed within pathology labs. And this is just one example of a study that we published two years ago, um, looking at the interaction between alcohol and smoking and survival. And I'll talk about some of these results in more detail. This has been very nicely summarized, this molecular pathology epidemiology study design by Shiji Ojino, who um, is based in Harvard and has really led the way in promoting this discipline um, and has been really important at um, raising awareness of it. And so far, much of my career has been based on studies that would be described as traditional epidemiology, box A at the top where we're interested in lifestyle factors and modifiable factors or genetic factors that are associated, <clears throat> excuse me, with both the risk or prognosis of a disease. And the example shown here is colorectal cancer. Of course, much of the research that you might've been involved in or studies that you would read about would be traditional pathology studies where you're looking at a particular molecular feature or a biomarker that is associated with uh, prognosis. <coughs> Excuse me. What we're really interested in, as I said, is trying to bring those two worlds together. So trying to understand lifestyle factors that may be associated with prognosis or with risk, but according to certain molecular uh, features or subgroup analysis, which is really important. And one of the reasons that we can do this so successfully in Northern Ireland is thanks to what I would call a triumvirate of infrastructure where we can use the Northern Ireland Cancer Registry as a sampling frame. <coughs> Excuse me. Sorry, just take a drink. We can then, uh, thanks to anonymized pathology numbers, um, link with the Northern Ireland Biobank, which is directed by uh, Professor Jackie James, to retrieve the samples of interest. 
And then often working with Professor Manuel Salto Teles's team in the Precision Medicine Center, do uh, some advanced analyses, um, particularly creating things like tissue microarrays. So this has been really beneficial to uh, uh, set up some of the research studies that I'll describe. I'm also very grateful to my funders, Cancer Research UK. Much of the work that I'm about to describe has been funded through one of two fellowships. So I was initially funded via a population research postdoctoral fellowship, which ran for four years from 2013 to 2016 to set up a colon cancer cohort um, stage three, two and three patients that we have used to analyze a number of questions. And then I'll be talking about some of my current work, um, which is funded by a CR UK Career Establishment Award and relates more to our Barrett's and esophageal adenocarcinoma work. So much of this uh, study design requires, uh, as I've mentioned, the cancer registry as a sampling frame. So we have used that to identify uh, five years worth of colon cancer cases. And uh, sorry, excuse me, I've got a tickly throat. <coughs> Thank you. And we were able to identify those who had undergone a surgical resection, because of course that's important to get enough tissue for some of the biomarker analysis that we wanted to do. At the time of this study, we were able to get up to 10 years information um, of follow-up in terms of survival. But it's really important to think about the scale of these types of studies. So I'm very grateful to Morris for not just shutting his door on me whenever we <laughs> initially proposed this study design, because in order to identify those cases, um, it required a review of something in the scale of more than 16,000 slides um, for review in order to identify the tumour representative slides that we wanted along with some others. So Morris trained one of our research fellows to do an initial review, but of course had to look at some of the more trickier cases and again did a quality check. So incredibly grateful to that time, which took about a year of Roisin and Morris working together to identify the cases that we wanted to include in this study. The other challenge for this scale of research is how do you um, do uh, sufficient quantitative scoring of the biomarkers at the end. And while I was able to convince Morris to help with identifying the review uh, of the cores, I'm sure himself and Manuel and Jackie would not have been impressed if I was asking them to also score all of the immunohistochemical chemical biomarkers we were interested in, four thousands of cores within these patients. But thankfully, uh, alongside this cohort that we were developing, um, Pete Bankhead in conjunction with Peter Hamilton and others at Queen's University Belfast had developed QPath, which again, I'm sure many of you are familiar with. And uh, we were able to then work together in a way that was quite synergistic, where our cohort was used to help validate some of the automated scoring um, possibilities that are used within QPath. And that then in turn facilitated large scale analysis within our cohort that simply would not have been possible otherwise. So I put this slide in because this is a really long term initiative. If you set off to create one of these resources, it was five years from the, the idea to getting our first results, <laughs> but that's OK, because sometimes it's really worth the effort. <clears throat> And one of the initial results that we found, um, again, thinking of it from an epidemiological perspective, I was interested in modifiable uh, risk factors. And my original fellowship was designed entirely around the vitamin D hypothesis, which some of you will be familiar with. So <clears throat> vitamin D is thought to be beneficial um, for uh, cancer risk and cancer survival. 
but there's lots of questions about whether it's due to residual confounding and it's just this general biomarker of a healthy lifestyle. <clears throat> Sorry, excuse me. And what we showed for the first time is that by looking at vitamin D receptor expression within the tumor tissue, we showed significant associations with a 30% reduced risk of death from colorectal cancer. So that suggests that it, there is something mechanistically going on with, with vitamin D um, that is not due to these other explanations. The other work then that I, I, I'm about to show you is very much the work of Jasmine Adali. So she is a PhD student who has just um, passed her viva over the summer and is co-supervised by Dr. Morris Lockery and Dr. Philip Dunn at Queen's University Belfast. And one of the most important findings that we have shown, um, and this is unpublished data, so within this cohort of colon cancer patients, we have shown that smokers have poor survival outcomes. That may not be particularly new to us. Um, we've shown that there's an approximately 50% increased risk of death, including cancer specific death amongst patients who were ever smokers compared with never smokers. Um, we didn't see any differences in survival outcomes by alcohol consumption. What's really, really important, though, is not to look at this just as a whole, because whenever we separated these results by MSI status, <clears throat> we actually find that the poor survival is only evident in patients with MSI high tumours. And in fact, they have an almost sixfold increased risk of cancer specific death compared with um, patients who were non-smokers. And this was not seen in patients with microsatellite stable tumors. So that goes against what we know in terms of MSI high tumors that we would have thought some of these, pa these patients would have a better prognosis. So this is currently unpublished data, <clears throat> but we would like to, to get it published within the next few months. And I think it's really important for our thinking and certainly for you if you're joining an MDT meeting and a patient with an MSI high tumour has an unexpectedly poor prognosis, <clears throat> it may be worth inquiring about some of these uh, lifestyle factors, particularly smoking. We have also, thanks to work from Ronan Gray, who is, <clears throat> excuse me, a consultant surgeon in the Southeastern Health and Social Care Trust in Northern Ireland and previously did a PhD with myself. We've published a lot of work on medications and survival outcomes from this cohort according to relevant uh, biomarkers within that pathway as well as some work with Sean Hines and Morris on uh, tumour microenvironment features and prognosis. So as an example of some of that work on aspirin and PTGS2 immunohistochemistry, um, we have shown that the beneficial effect of aspirin was limited to patients who had high expression of PTGS2 within their tumours. We didn't see a significant difference by PIK3CA mutation, but it, it was going um, in the right direction. But certainly we, we found stronger differences by expression of um, PTGS2. And that may be important because there's already trials ongoing where um, individuals are being given um, aspirin according to their PIK3CA mutations, um, not, not expression of PTGS2. So circling back to one of the first studies I described where we showed that there was no association between aspirin and survival within esophageal and gastric cancer patients, I think it's really important to question ourselves as epidemiologists um, by not applying these more sophisticated study designs. Are we missing something for other cancers, something that's really important for subgroups of these patients? 
So we've done some initial work within small uh, esophageal cancer, uh, within small cohorts of esophageal cancer patients in Belfast. So I'm very grateful to Dr. Richard Turkington, who is an oncologist and collaborator at Queen's, who worked with Dr. Damian McManus to set up this TMA cohort, where we have uh, a TMAs relating to 130 patients who underwent surgery and chemotherapy within Northern Ireland over an eight year period. And working with uh, one of our MD students who is now a consultant HPB surgeon in Belfast, Stephen McCain, um, we again showed that individuals with higher vitamin D receptor expression um, had uh, more longer term survival after their surgery. So this suggests that we should be moving towards some trials of um, vitamin D supplementation uh, within patients um, to see if this will influence survival outcomes after treatment. In terms of smoking and alcohol then, um, and GI cancer survival, uh, this is a systematic review that has been conducted by my colleagues Una Stephen and Dr. Andrew Kinsman in Belfast. And this seems like a question that we should know the answer to. Surely we know what the association is between these lifestyle factors and survival in GI cancer patients. At the time of this study, though, there had only been four publications investigating the association between smoking and alcohol on survival in esophageal adenocarcinoma patients. And these were quite limited. Um, in particular, two of them weren't even able to adjust for age in their models of survival, which is really important and had very limited adjustments for others. And we didn't have any representation from UK populations. So we, we didn't really know how this applied to our population, where unfortunately we do have higher rates of um, smoking prevalence and, and alcohol consumption. So in, within this study then, we investigated uh, smoking and alcohol in relation to survival in these esophageal cancer patients. And what we showed was there was no associations this time for smoking. But we did see what was relatively surprising to us, non-significant increased risk of death for patients who were ever alcohol consumers. Um, and the reason that this is surprising to us is that alcohol is not associated with risk of esophageal adenocarcinoma. It's one of the few malignancies that alcohol isn't associated with. So we don't really understand the mechanisms here. And this was uh, you know, adjusted for many uh, different clinical factors and also um, pathology factors that we know are associated with prognosis. We tried to investigate if these differences um, represented small subgroups of patients. And we, we showed that there was higher risks of death for alcohol consumers who had P53 normal expression, GLUT1 positive tumors, uh, CD8 positive. Um, there was no particular hypothesis behind these investigations. This is very much a hypothesis generating um, analysis because we happen to have um, data on these biomarkers, but certainly it warrants further investigation. So with these small numbers and unadjusted analysis, we're, we've raised more questions that need to be answered. And um, thanks to the Occam's Consortium and to uh, Professor Rebecca Fitzgerald leadership um, and CRUK's funding, we are now trying to apply some of these questions within much larger uh, cohorts that represent um, patients throughout the UK. You may uh, be familiar with the Occam's Cohort, one of the um, highest impact papers came a few years ago in Nature Genetics showing that there's likely to be uh, distinct, ideologically distinct subgroups of patients within esophageal adenocarcinoma patients. Um, and this work from Maria Seacrier showed that there was potentially three molecular subgroups that we should be considering. This 
consortium also has very detailed clinical data. Um, in this case, patients have completed questionnaires about uh, various lifestyle factors, but here's some examples of the, the questions around alcohol and smoking. And so what we're hoping to do in, our, in my fellowship research is to investigate if some of these exposures like smoking, alcohol, obesity, vitamin D and aspirin may be associated with survival outcomes, but importantly, taking into consideration some of those molecular subtypes, as well as some of the um, biomarkers that I've described so far. And in terms of a TMA design, I'm very grateful to Matt Humphreys, who's now at the University of Leeds, but <clears throat> formerly at the Precision Medicine Centre, and uh, the team uh, there for helping to design this TMA. And the PMC is responsible then for the creation of these TMAs, um, which is uh, originating from, from samples from several centres throughout the UK. And we're aiming for up to three tumor cores per patient. Um, we have a separate Barrett's TMA for any adjacent Barrett's. I've put in this table just to show the, the various steps involved with, with some of this. You know, it involves lots of annotation and review. Um, we also had some regrossing of mega blocks. So this is us at the, the beginning of that long journey again of setting up a really important cohort. <clears throat> And this is an example of the first TMA that was created. Um, and it's always really impressive to me to see the scale of these TMAs um, in terms of size. And again, just very grateful to the technologies that are available now, allowing us to answer these questions within these large cohorts of patients. So the next step for my fellowship research is to conduct more detailed survival analysis within the Occam's cohort, um, working with the PMC team on the creation of the tissue microarrays and allowing more of these molecular pathology epidemiology questions within this cohort. So I started off my talk this morning with how do we move from what is currently in my world of these traditional epidemiology questions, uh, what's currently mostly your world of these traditional molecular pathology questions and coming together more to answer uh, in, in a more interactive way. And this requires a lot of teamwork um, and it requires a lot of collaborations. It requires bigger sample sizes, it requires interdisciplinary working. And in order to facilitate that, we need funders and important stakeholders such as the Pathology Society to, I guess, recognize the complex approach needed and the long timelines needed um, for some of this. And I'm very grateful to those supporters that we've had for our work to date. Um, and would really encourage you to think about um, getting involved in some of these studies uh, if, if this is of interest. So finally, I'd like to acknowledge uh, my important collaborators. Um, so this is a reflection of that massive team that is required, and I've particularly highlighted Morris and uh, Jackie and Manuel for our colon cancer research. <clears throat> I also want to acknowledge the late Professor Liam Murray, who was the former lead of the Cancer Epidemiology Research Group at Queen's and first introduced me to these study designs and to acknowledge the, the massive team effort then that's involved in our esophageal cancer research, and particularly Dr. Damien McManus. So thank you very much for your time this morning. I hope uh, I've uh, shown you something new and uh, uh, stimulated your thinking and very much welcome any questions or general comments that you may have. So, Thank you again to the Pathology Society and to Mark for the invitation to speak this morning. Okay, thank you very much indeed for that really interesting talk. Helen, you've summarized a lot of very interesting data. And if this were a live meeting, I'm sure there'd be a, a loud sound of clapping right now. Uh, okay, so we, we move on to questions and answers. So please, can I ask the audience to type your questions into the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. Um, whilst you do that, I'm going to start off with the first question, if I may. 
Um, you did describe a study <coughs> um, where you looked at colorectal cancers and smoking and, and you found a relationship uh, with smoking and survival, but only in those with microsatellite instability at high frequency, MSI mm -hmm. high. Now, I, I was going to ask you for your thoughts on the possible mechanism for this. And my yes. reason for asking is that typically we think of MSI high colorectal cancers as generating a lot of neoepitopes, generating a strong immune response. You often see a lot of tumor infiltrating lymphocytes into such cancers. But we also think about smoking as another way of generating a lot of um, mutations of the DNA and generating neoepitopes as well. And it's another way of, of generating a strong immune response, certainly in lung cancers, but possibly also in colorectal cancers. So what, what are your thoughts on, on that relationship between smoking and MSI high? Yeah, I think it's a great question, Mark. And um, <clears throat> one of the other chapters within Jasmine's PhD tried to investigate the associations by CD3, CD4, CD8, and FOXP3. And what we found was really inconsistent associations across those. So we, we were as puzzled. It was a real struggle for Jasmine to write it up in a way that made sense. Um, we saw different associations if we looked at tumor core expression as opposed to uh, cores from the invasive edge, for example. So I think the, the truthful answer is we don't know and, the, and that we need to better understand this. And, um, you know, if, if there's people in this audience that have ways and means to investigate this, this hypothesis, it would be wonderful um, because I think collectively we would like to better understand it and to make sure that it is biologically plausible. Okay, thank you very much for, for that. Um, now, we have some questions uh, appearing in the box, so <clears throat> I'll, I'll read them out. So the first one is from James Morris, who asks, have you any thoughts on the association of periodontitis and periodontal pathogens, such mm -hmm. as P. gingivalis and F. nucleatum with gastrointestinal cancer? Yes, um, that's that's a great topic, um, and again was the the <clears throat> center point of one of my other PhD students who investigated oral health and related to GI uh, disease. Um, what we showed is that F nucleatum is likely to be a passenger, so it's likely to be something that is attracted to the tumor after it's already metastasized. Um, we didn't show any associations um, in earlier stage disease. Um, if you uh, talk to my colleague, Dr. Jerry McKenna, who is the, the dentist who advises on all of that work, um, he said you'll find an association for periodontitis with everything. <clears throat> so it's very general systemic inflammation. Um, and the biological plausibility of that uh, is highly questionable. But in saying that, I do think we need to do more on uh, the oral microbiome in relation to uh, risk of all GI cancers. And I had the pleasure of examining um, work of a PhD student in Sweden at the Karolinska Institute recently that showed for the first time that there was an association between specific aspects of oral health um, and in particular, root canal infections in relation to esophageal, uh, both adenocarcinoma and squamous cell carcinoma, which I find interesting because you wouldn't expect those to have come from the same pathways. So again, I think we need, we need more, but I think there was a lot of papers on F nucleatum recently, but I don't personally, I think it's more about a passenger and I don't think it's actually driving um, the cancer risk, certainly for colorectal cancer. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Next question is from Sarah Aitken. Uh, Sarah says, very interesting talk, Helen, thank you. Do you think that epidemiologists should be included in cancer multidisciplinary team discussions? Of course, I'm gonna say yes, <laughs> I would love that. <laughs> Yeah, I, th I think certainly, uh, you know, if, if the smoking and MSI high tumor interaction holds out, for example, it could be really important um, whether we need to be involved in, in clinical decision making that, that results from that. 
Uh, I'm not sure, but certainly it would be nice to be able to inform um, some of those, uh, or at least taken into consideration. I, I do think it's a huge part of the patient's history that perhaps doesn't get enough attention in discussions. Um, but we've seen major changes, for example, with prehabilitation and the importance of physical activity in preparing patients for surgery. So we could see other changes um, over the next five to 10 years. Okay, thank you. So the next question is from Anshuman Chaturvedi. Are there any squamous cell carcinomas included in the registry or is the scope limited to purely Barrett's and adenocarcinoma? Yeah, that, that's, uh, thank you very much for that question. So thanks to the linkage, we can link to all cancers within the cancer registry. So although we've published on adenocarcinoma risk in that JNCI paper that I mentioned, in our updated analysis, we're actually linking to all cancers. Uh, and I'm particularly interested in looking at the risk of other cancers such as, for example, lung cancer and um, uh, head and neck cancers, not from the perspective that I think Barrett's is um, influencing the risk of those directly, but I think there are shared risk factors. So, for example, smoking history. Mm. And say, for example, we find that patients with Barrett's esophagus are actually much more likely to die from lung cancer than they are from their esophageal adenocarcinoma. We may be better sending them for a CT screen um, uh, or uh, in addition to their upper GI endo endoscopic surveillance. Um, so we're, we are trying to think much more holistically and that has been very much informed by our patient and public involvement group with the Barrett's work. So um, we can look specifically at esophageal squamous cell carcinomas, but also other cancers um, within our updated analysis. Okay, thank you. So staying on that theme, and she a second question. Are there any international collaborations with countries where esophageal squamous cell carcinoma is a prominent subgroup epidemiologically? Yeah, um, it's it's like you would think I'd asked for these questions to be to be asked, and that's not true. Um, so I've identified that squamous cell carcinoma research is something that we haven't done historically and that we need to do more of. And we've actually just in the last year been joined by an epidemiologist called Dr. Dan Middleton. Dan previously worked at IARC and was involved in lots of the ESCAPE studies, which are case control studies of esophageal squamous cell carcinoma in East Africa, um, uh, particularly in Tanzania. He's been involved um, in some feasibility work of the cytosponge rollout um, there. And you know, it's really, really interesting to do these comparisons. Squamous cell carcinoma, of course, is a completely different in terms of where it's most prominent. Um, but something that I think is really helpful is to actually compare adenocarcinoma and squamous cell carcinoma, because there's some associations that go in completely opposite directions. So for example, um, BMI, being overweight or obese, is really strongly associated with adenocarcinoma. It's actually associated with a reduced risk of squamous cell carcinoma, which may be due to some residual confounding. But in our physical activity paper, we, we showed that there's actually opposite associations there as well. Um, and so I think we need to do a lot more in terms of the collaborations. And I'm hopeful that Dan joining our group will help to catalyze some of those. Okay, good. Um... So a question from Andrew Dean, given that statins are involved with vitamin D synthesis, have you looked at interactions between vitamin D and mevalonate? Yeah, um, not yet, but I will now. Thank you, Andrew. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, certainly within the studies we've done so far, uh, one of the things we have to be wary of is sample size. So once we start getting down to very small subgroups, it can be hard to um, trust the results. But I'm hopeful with some of these larger cohorts, particularly within Occam's, we should definitely look at interactions like that. So thank you very much. OK, good. So the next question is from a person you might know quite well, uh, <laughs> Morris Lockery. 
who says, thanks, Helen. We are in the new era of artificial intelligence based pathology research and seeing a lot of ROC, AOC analyses, as you illustrated in some of your esophageal MPE work. Yeah. What level of C statistic do you think is needed to get a new tool into clinical use? Yeah, that's that's the the golden question of how long is a piece of string, isn't it? Because <laughs> um, if you get one that's that's really good, like not point nine nine, um, you then don't trust it either and think that that's too perfect. Um, but it, it probably it depends on lots of factors. It depends on. Um, you know, the reproducibility of some of those things uh, that you're measuring as well. But you, you are wanting to say, I would suggest closer to the 0.9 uh, than, um, than we have so far. OK, thank you. Uh, and returning to the first question I asked you, we've got another question on the, on the same theme from, from Miriam Fischel. Thank you for the great talk. Just some thoughts about poorer prognosis in MSI HCRC patients who are smokers. Could it be that they can repair less efficiently additional mutations induced by smoking? Mm -hmm. Any differences in tumor mutational burden between smokers MSIH and non-smokers MSIH uh, cancers? Have you investigated responses to immunotherapy? Yeah, so within that cohort, that was the, the patients were treated in 2004 to 2008, so it predated um, immunotherapy, but I think it would be fascinating to investigate that within um, more updated cohorts. Um, we haven't looked specifically at the, at the questions that, that you're answering, because what we have done is, is a cross-sectional take. Uh, so at the time of surgery, these are the mutation burden, this is the expression. I think what we'd really need to do to answer that question um, about repair is to, to have sequential samples. Um, but uh, yeah, I, th I think the overarching thing is there's so much that we still don't understand about that association um, and that we need lots of people to look at it from lots of different perspectives. OK, thank you. Uh, in fact, that's all the questions we have from the Q&A box. So I think we can wrap this up and let me finish off by thanking you once again, Helen, for a really interesting talk, summarising a, a lot of very interesting studies. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. And I'm delighted to have received so many questions and interactions. Thank you, Mark. OK. Thank you. And, and, and that's it, everybody. We have a tradition of finishing on time. So, so we've finished just a few minutes early, um, just before 10. So thank you, everybody. And our next Pathology Grand Rounds is in a month's time uh, in mid-October. Thank you and goodbye.